morning. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping with you this morning. It is good for my soul. I recently saw an article in a Christianity Today that referenced a study that had been done of Christians in higher education, Christian students in higher education, and the study found that Christians at universities and state schools tended to follow a, a trend line of struggling with their faith their freshman year and settling on what they believe their junior year, whereas Christian students at Christian colleges like Covenant and others in the Christian, or the Consortium for Christian Colleges and Universities tended to um, act opposite to that. Their doubts increased up to their junior year from their freshman year. I tend to think it's something we don't want to talk about, doubt that we think somehow it makes us a bad Christian, when really it just makes us a Christian. We have opportunities in a place like this to actually confess our doubts. And we have opportunities, an opportunity today to actually look at a fellow believer, and actually the worship leader of Israel, Asaph, as he confesses and wrestles with his own doubt here in Psalm 73. He begins with the words, truly God is good to Israel. But as we will see, he arrives at that conclusion through much struggle. And I think we have opportunity to learn from his experience. Please pray with me. Father, open our eyes that we might see you more clearly through your word. I ask that you get me out of the way, that you might speak to our hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, I really just, I want us to walk through Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. Asaph's statement of goodness, the goodness of God, is immediately followed by his confession of struggle. He had nearly slipped. He had nearly fallen. He had nearly he had nearly fallen, he had nearly lost his faith. What a gift we have here in God's word to actually be able to peek in to someone else's prayers, someone's honest confession and struggle, being brutally honest with God about his envy and his doubt. It goes on here, verses 3 and 4, sum up the next 10 verses. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. What, what disorients Asaph, but also attracts him, is what he perceives to be the effortless ease of the wicked and their arrogant disdain for God. Look at this description as it continues. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues strut through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. As we will see as we go on, Asaph is not merely describing the behavior of the wicked, but also confessing what was increasingly attractive to him about their prosperous and trouble-free lives. We're witnesses here to Asaph's descent into doubt, paved by his very own envy, his growing desire not for God himself, but for what God could give him. For Asaph, as with us, the first step of falling away, the first slip comes with being discontent with God and doubting what he has said is true. Asaph's envy comes quite naturally to him, for he, like us, is a spiritual descendant of envious doubters. Starting in the garden, Satan convinces Adam and Eve that somehow paradise is imperfect. 
that to not have access to the one tree is to create doubt about God's love and provision for them. If they could only desire that. And so it continues. Cain envies what Abel has until he must kill him for it. We see it continue with Jacob and Esau, with Joseph and his brothers, envy driving them to, drastic, to take drastic measures. We see the Israelites' discontent in the wilderness actually uh, driving them and twisting them to actually envy the conditions they had as slaves, so blind they are to what God has provided for them in their need. And King David, a king with access to all that a king has, envies Uriah to the point that he takes his life and takes Uriah's very life. Envy disorients, envy destroys, it separates us from God and leaves us ever wanting more. It will not allow us to be satisfied with what we have and leaves us unable to tolerate someone having something that we don't have. Look at our own envy today, the things that draw our eyes away from God, causes us to doubt that he cares. I don't care if you're three or 83, we all envy. It's a struggle for everyone. I've watched children from a young age, not naming any names, both get equally valuable but different Christmas presents and instantly want what the other one has. We all do this. We experience envy of other people's stuff, other people's belongings and experiences and jobs and grades and personalities and so on. We're bombarded throughout the day with devices just like this. Little envy factories with push notifications that continue to remind us each day, each hour, each minute of what other people have, and how other people look, and what other people are doing. And we increasingly ask, why don't I look like that? Why wasn't I invited to that? Why am I not being included? We look around us at a place like Covenant. We ask questions. Why did she make varsity? What does he see in her? How did she get a better grade than me when I studied more than her? I deserve that. Why don't they have any problems? Why are things so easy and effortless and I've got to work myself to the bone? Why did everybody listen when he said it after I said the same exact thing? Why can't I have that personality? Why don't people see me? And unfortunately, I must break it to you that it continues on after college. Same song, different verse. Why did he get that promotion instead of me? I wish my husband was more like him. Why is it so easy for them to get pregnant? Why can't our kids behave like that? Why can't we afford a house like that? Why weren't we invited to that party? Why won't anybody talk to me after church? Why doesn't anybody notice me? The cycle continues, and it feeds on itself. And we look out, and all we see is corrupt people continuing to win, oppressors remaining free, the rich getting richer, the New England Patriots still continuing to win. That was not the place to clap. <laughs> Meanwhile, we grow increasingly discontented with what we do have, increasingly desire what other people have, and we wonder, does God really care? Envy feeds on us as it destroys us, as it undercuts us from inside. Asaph envied this. He wanted the ease. He wanted the prosperity of the carefree life. He wanted to reap the rewards without the righteousness. He wants wealth. He values what they have over what he has. Ultimately, he's having a difficult time reconciling what he knows that God is truly good to Israel with what he's experiencing, what he's seeing with his own eyes. And this causes a crisis of faith. And he reaches his breaking point. Verses 13 through 15. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. Is this the Christian life? Is it, is it really worth it what I'm doing? Is what he's asking here. 
What do I have to show for it? He goes on, for all the day long I've been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. He knows what he's feeling is wrong. He, he doesn't want to pass it on to the next generation, but he's struggling to reconcile it. First, envy steals our joy. It breeds discontentment in our lives. But most dangerously of all, it separates us from God. It causes us to doubt him and to believe his goodness isn't very good. And if we don't, if, if we don't have what we want, and that's the way of envy. We don't love God so much as we love what God can give us. Our obedience becomes conditional, uh, transactional. The reality is the prosperity gospel is alive and well in our hearts. And that's why it's important to not forget the second part of verse 1. Listen to it again. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. The phrase is familiar to us because it's used in Scripture several places. Most famously, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus read or spoke to uh, his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, the sixth beatitude. It reads, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Envy blinds us not only to what we have, and soon it only allows us to see what we don't have. Envy cannot diminish God, but it can blind us to him. We, uh, as a family, had an incredible vacation two summers ago. We went out west, and we toured the national parks in Utah and Arizona. And some of these might be familiar to you. We see here Bryce Canyon, Zion National Park, and the first one, the famous Ua Point of the Grand Canyon. They were most certainly glorious, um, awe-inspiring creations of our God. But consider these bottle caps. Effectively uh, worthless without a bottle, probably worth fractions of a penny in terms of what it took to cost, of what it, what it cost to make them. But as I take them and I bring them closer and closer to my eyes, They obscure my view of everything else. Now, are they bigger than the Grand Canyon? No. Thousands of people have probably thrown those in the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon laughs at that. But proximity and priority matter. How close I hold things in my heart can actually obscure my view of everything else. I can be blinded to God's glorious provision and grace by envy by how close I hold things, by how much I love them. And as we see in Asaph, this further intensifies his crisis of faith. He simply cannot reconcile this on his own. He continues as we see verse 16, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. When Asaph tried to understand it, he could not. No amount of philosophizing, no amount of rationalizing. It's an impossible task. We cannot understand it in our own wisdom. We cannot understand it in our own strength. We can understand it through our own experience. So we find that as we try, and as ASAP tried, we wear ourselves out. And so what is the answer? Until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I discerned their end. The only antidote to envy, the only antidote to doubt, is worship. The only way to understand is in the sanctuary. We cannot understand from our limited perspective. We must come into the sanctuary, into the presence of God. We must have his perspective. The opposite of envy is to worship, to die to ourselves, to actually see from God's perspective, to have the clarity of vision that he has that comes from a pure heart, 
to see more clearly, to see more completely, to trust his promises. We were convicted in the sanctuary and we recognized the whole time that we were envying bottle caps. The creator of the universe is right beside us all the time. We've got to come into the sanctuary to get this perspective and we need to come regularly. I drive a 2001 CRV. It's older than many of you in this room and it's a great car with one noticeable flaw. It comes out of alignment very easily. So every time I hit a bump, every time I hit a pothole, it knocks it a little bit more out of alignment, unbalances the wheels, causes the car to drive in a way that it shouldn't, and eventually wears out my tires. It's my job to know this, to get the shit into the shop and to get it realigned. And that's what we have going on here. Our hearts need to be realigned and recalibrated regularly. It doesn't take much to knock us out of alignment. We hit a bump of discontent, we hit a pothole of envy, and it unbalances us and it wears us down. It causes us to doubt God is who he says he is, and actually causes us to doubt that he actually loves us like he says he would. We often treat the gospel like a vaccine. Got my shot, I'm good. Maybe I'll need a booster shot in five years. But the gospel is not only a vaccine, it's also a daily vitamin. The gospel of grace certainly saves us and seals us, but we also need to daily be consuming it. That is what it means to come to the sanctuary. We must be regularly encountering the Lord through his word, through prayer, through the worship and fellowship that we enjoy with fellow believers. It's why what we do here every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 11 a.m. is so important and why the college has made it a priority. But we see that Asaph realizes some other things in the sanctuary. Truly you set them in slippery places, you make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. As we noted, the first thing that he sees in the sanctuary is the end, the destiny of the wicked. His upside down perspective is turned right side up in the sanctuary. His limited point of view is enlarged. You and I have a finite number of data points. It's what we can take in through our eyes and ears and our experience. It's the same limited data points that Asaph had. When you come into the sanctuary, you realize that God has an infinite data set. He has all the data points. And in worship, we are reoriented to see as he sees and to trust what he has said. And what he has said is justice is coming. I say that with awareness that there are people here who have been hurt, people here who have been wounded. And I'm telling you, as it says here, whether in this world or the next, oppressors will oppress no more. Abusers will abuse no more. The wicked will receive their due. Whereas Asaph nearly slipped and nearly fell, we see that the wicked in God's judgment actually do slip and fall and are destroyed and remembered no more. In contrast, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever to those he has called his own. It's in meeting with the Lord and being in his presence that our experiences begin to make sense that we realize that, we've been in, that what we've been envying does not have any value at all. And that, especially when compared to the surpassing greatness of our God, please understand that Asaph's situation hasn't changed. What has changed is his perception of his situation. This verse 17 is the whole hinge of this passage. It's the turning point for a man in crisis. By coming into the sanctuary, he realizes that all along, he had the greatest thing. But in the sanctuary, Asaph receives more than understanding about the ultimate destiny of the wicked. He also sees his sin, and he sees God's lavish grace. See the rest of this passage here. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant, I was like a beast towards you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. 
Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I've made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. In the sanctuary, Asaph sees first his own sin and then God's grace. With a heart consumed by envy, Asaph was blind to his own sin, but now he sees. In the sanctuary, as his perspective is exponentially widened, he sees the supreme majesty of God, and he sees that he was brutish, and he was beast-like. He was blind, senseless, and selfish. More like a beast than the image bearer that he was created to be. But he also sees very clearly God's astounding grace. This word, nevertheless, is a wonderful encapsulation of the gospel. In spite of our sin, in spite of our senseless, beast-like behavior, in spite of our doubt, in spite of our envy and discontent, nevertheless, he is continually with us. He takes hold of our hand, and he guides us, and he simply does not let go. He leads, guides, and as we see, he will glorify us. Our flesh and our heart will fail, but he will not. So remember this, Christian, and boldly confess your doubt and your envy God is not scared of your doubt. He's not surprised by your doubt, just as he wasn't with Asaph. Struggle is the soil in which we grow. As we do it in the sanctuary and with God's people, knowing the certainty of his love for us. It was God and God alone who kept Asaph from falling. Don't miss that. He did not allow his foot to stumble because he was holding his hand long before he ever came into the sanctuary. It's why he didn't fall. And it's in worship that we are reminded of this, that we're able to doubt our doubt and love the Father for who he is and not what we can get from him. Many of us attend churches where it is normal to pronounce a benediction at the end of the service, and one of the most familiar is the blessing given by God through Moses to Aaron in Numbers chapter 6. This will be familiar to many of you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That is the blessing given to every Christian in all times and in all places. We are all the beneficiaries of that blessing. But as a professor of mine in seminary has shared, that while Aaron's blessing has been for all of God's people, when you reverse that blessing, you see the curse that was pronounced on Jesus Christ alone. The Lord curse you and abandon you. The Lord turn his face from you and remove all his grace and favor from you. The Lord abandon you with his presence and take from you all peace. I close with this. Jesus Christ is the only person who can literally say, I went through hell for you. Others have said it, including a number of country songs and rom-coms. But only Jesus actually did it. And if he did not let go of you in the Garden of Gethsemane when his heart and his soul was deeply troubled, and if he did not let go of you when he hung on the cross with the weight of every one of your sins and mine, and if he didn't let go of you when he descended into hell, breaking the eternal fellowship with his father as his father turned his back on him, 
He will not let go of you now. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the neverthelesses of our lives that you hold on to us and you guide us even when we are brutish and envious beasts. Give us courage and strength to come regularly into your sanctuary that we might see through your eyes, that we might have our perspective grow more eternal and less earthly, more aligned with you that we might always realize your goodness to us, that we may know with certainty that we have what is best in you and nothing else compares. And Father, help us to help one another remember this when we have forgotten it. Father, our flesh, our hearts will fail, but you are the strength of our lives. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.